Chapter Thirty Four of The Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Thirty Four. While scientists seek germs that shall change the world, while war comes or winter takes earth captive, even while love visibly flowers, a power mighty as any of these lashes its human pack train on the dusty road to futility. The day's work is the name of that power. All these days of first love Carl had the office for lowering background. The warm trust of Ruth's hand on a Saturday did not make plans for the Turricar any the less pressing on a Monday. The tyranny of nine to five is stronger, more insistent, in every department of life than the most officious oligarchy inspectors can be bribed judges softened and recruiting sergeants evaded but only the grace of god will turn three thirty into five thirty and mr erickson of the turricar company a not vastly important employee of the mothering van zale corporation was not entitled to go home at three thirty as a really rational man would have done when the sun gold misted the windows and suggested skating no longer was business essentially an adventure to Carl. Doubtless, he would give it up and have gone to Palm Beach to fly a hydro for Bagby, Jr., had there been no Ruth. Bagby wrote that he was coming north to prepare for the spring's experiments. Would Carl consider joining him? Carl was now, between his salary and his investment in the Turricar Company, making about $4,000 a year and saving nearly half of it against the inevitable next change in his life whatever that should be. It would probably climb to $10,000 in five years. The Turricar was promising success. Several had been ordered at the automobile show. The Chicago, Boston, and Philadelphia agents of the company reported interest. For no particular reason, apparently Milwaukee had taken them up first. Three Milwaukee people had ordered cars. An artist was making posters with beautiful gypsies and a Turricar, and tourists whose countenances showed lively appreciation of the efforts of the kind of tour-car manufacturers to please and benefit them. But the head salesman of the company laughed at Carl when he suggested that the tour-car might not only bring them money, but really take people off to a larger freedom. "'I don't care a hang where they go with the thing as long as they pay for it. You can't be an idealist and make money. You make the money, and then you can have all the ideals you want.' give way some hospitals and libraries. They walked and talked, Ruth and Carl. They threaded the Sunday afternoon throng on Upper Broadway, where, on every clear Sunday, all the apartment dwellers, if they had remembered to have their trousers pressed or their gloves cleaned in preparation, promenaded like stupid black-and-white peacocks past uninteresting apartment houses and uninspiring Upper Broadway shops while two blocks away, glorious Riverside Drive, with its panorama of Hudson and hills and billowing clouds, its trees and secret walks in the Soldiers' and Sailors' Monument, is nearly deserted. Together they scorned the glossy, well-to-do merchant in his newly ironed top hat, and was thus drawn together. It is written that loving the same cause makes honest friendship, but hating the same people makes alliances so delightful that one can sit up late nights talking. At the opening of the flying season, Carl took her to Hampstead Plains Aviation Field, and, hearing his explanations, she at last comprehended emotionally that he really was an aviator. They tramped through Staten Island. They had tea at the Manhattan. Carl dined with Ruth and her father. Once he took her brother Mason to lunch at the Aero Club. Ruth was ill in March, not with a mysterious and romantic malady, but with a grip, which, she wrote Carl, made her hate the human race, New York charity and Shakespeare. She could not decide whether to go to Europe or to die in a swoon and be buried under a mossy headstone. He answered that he would go abroad for her, and every day she received tokens bearing New York postmarks, yet obviously coming from foreign ports, a souvenir card from the... Uh, Perius, stating that Carl was visiting Cousin T. Demetrio Philadelphus, and 
We are enjoying our drive so much, Dem. Sends his love. Wish you could be with us. An absurd string of beets from Port Said and a box of Syrian sweets, a Hindu puzzle guaranteed to amuse victims of the grip, and gold fabric slippers of China, with long letters nonchalantly relating encounters with outlaws and wrecks and new varieties of disease. He called on her before her nose had quite lost the grip, or her temper the badness. Phil Dunleavy was there, lofty and cultured in evening clothes, apparently not eager to go. He stayed till ten minutes to ten, and, by his manner of cold surprise, when Carl tried to influence the conversation, was able to keep it to the Chrysler violin recitals, the architecture of St. John the Divine, and Whitney's polo, while Carl tried not to look sulky, and maneuvered to get out the excellent things he was prepared to say on other topics. Not unlike the small boy who wants to interrupt whist players and tell them about his new skates. When Phil was gone, Ruth sighed and said belligerently, Poor Phil, he has to work so hard, and all the people at the office, even the firm, are just as common as they can be, common as the children at my beastly old settlement house. What do you mean by common? bristled Carl. Not of our class. What do you mean by our class? And the battle was set. Ruth refused to withdraw common. Carl recalled Abraham Lincoln and Golden Rule Jones and Walt Whitman on the subject of the common people, though as to what these sages had said, he was vague. Ruth burst out. Oh, you can talk all you like about theories, but just the same in real life most people are common as dirt and just about as admissible to society. It's all very fine to be good to servants, but you would be the first to complain if I invited the cook up here. Give her and her children education for three generations. She was perfectly unreasonable and right in most of the things she said. He was perfectly unreasonable and right in all of the things he said. Their argument was absurdly hot and hurt them pathetically. It was difficult at first for Carl to admit that he was at odds with his playmate. Surely this was a sham dissension of which they would soon tire, which they would smilingly give up. Then he was trying not to be too contentious, but was irritated into retorting. After thirteen minutes they were staring at each other as at intruding strangers. He remembering the fact that she was a result of city life, she the fact that he wasn't the product of city life. And fact which neither of them realized, save subconsciously, was in the background. Carl himself had come in a few years from Oscar Erickson's backyard to Ruth Winslow's library. He had made the step naturally, as only an American could. But it was a step. She was loftily polite. I'm afraid you can't quite understand what the niceties of life mean to people like Phil. I'm sorry he won't give them up to the first truck driver he meets. But I'm afraid he won't, and occasionally it's necessary to face facts. Niceties of the kind he has... Grr, nice? Really? Her heavy eyebrows arched in a frown. If you're going to get nice on me, of course... You'll have to be condescending, and that's one thing I won't permit. I'm afraid you'll find that one has to permit a great many things. Sometimes, apparently, I must permit great rudeness. Have I been rude? Have? Yes, very. He could endure no more. Good night, he growled, and was gone. He was frightened to find himself out of the house. The door closed between them. No going back without ringing the bell. He couldn't go back. He walked a block, slow, incredulous. He stood hesitant before the nearest corner drug store, shivering in the March wind, wondering if he dared go into the store and telephone her. He was willing to concede anything. He planned apt phrases to use. Surely everything would be made right if he could only speak to her. He pictured himself crossing the drug store floor, entering the telephone booth, putting five cents in the slot. He stared at the red and green globes in the druggist's window, inspected a display of soaps, 
and recollected the fact that for a week now he had failed to take home any shaving soap, and he had to use an ordinary hand soap. Golly, I must go in and get a shaving stick. No, darn it, I haven't got enough money with me. I must try to remember to get some tomorrow. He rebuked himself for thinking of soap when love lay dying. But I must remember to get that soap just the same. So grotesque is man, the slave and angel. For a while he was sick with the desire to go back to the one comrade. He sharply wondered if he was not merely acting all his agony. He went into the store, but did not telephone to Ruth. There was no sufficiently convincing reason for calling her up. He bought a silly ice-cream soda and talked to the man behind the counter as he drank it. All the while a tragic Ruth stood before him, blaming him for he knew not what. He reluctantly went on, regretting every step that took him from her. But as he reached the next corner his shoulders snapped back into defiant straightness. He thrust his hands into his side pockets of his top coat and strode away, feeling that he had shaken off a burden of niceness. He had, willy-nilly, recovered his freedom. He could go anywhere now, mingle with any sort of people, be common and comfortable. He didn't have to take dancing lessons or fear the result of losing his job or of being robbed of his interest in the Turricar. He glanced, interestingly, at a pretty girl, recklessly, went into a cigar store and bought a fifteen-cent cigar. He was free again. As he marched on, however, his defiance began to ooze away. He went over every word Ruth or he had said, and when he reached his room he sat deep in an armchair like a hurt animal, crouching, his coat still on, his felt hat over his eyes, his tie a trifle disarranged, his legs straight out before him, his hands in his trouser pocket, while he discontentedly contemplated a photograph of Forrest Havland in full-dress uniform that stood on the low bureau among tangled ties, stray cigarettes, a bronze aviation medal, cuff buttons, and a haberdasher's round package of new collars. His gaze was steady and gloomy. He was dramatizing himself as hero in a melodrama. He did not know how the play would end. But his dramatization of himself did not indicate that he was not in earnest. Horace's portrait suggested to him, as it had before, that he had no picture of Ruth, that he wanted one. Next time he saw her, he would ask her. Then he remembered. He took out his new cigar, turned it over and over, gloweringly, and chewed it without lighting it. The right corner of his mouth, vicious in appearance. But his tone was plaintive as he mourned. How did it all start, anyway? He drew off his topcoat and shoes and put on his shabby, though once expensive, slippers. Slowly he lay on his bed. He certainly did not intend to go to sleep, but he awoke at two a.m., dressed, the light burning, his windows closed, feeling sweaty and hot and dirty and dry-mouthed, a victim of all the woes since Troy burned. He shucked off his clothes as you shuck an ear of corn. When he awoke in the morning, he lay as usual, greeting a shining new day till he realized that it was not a shining day. It was an ominous day. Everything was wrong. That something had happened, really had, was a fact that sternly patrolled his room. His chief reaction was not recompense or dramatic interest, but a vexed longing to unwish the whole affair. Hang it, he groaned. Already he was eager to make peace. He sympathized with Ruth. Poor kid! It was rotten to row with her her completely all in with the grip. At three in the afternoon he telephoned her house. Myth Ruth, he was informed, was asleep. She was not very well. Would the maid please ask Miss Ruth to call Mr. Erickson when she awoke? Certainly the maid would. But by bedtime Ruth had not telephoned. Self-respect would not let him call again, for days, and Ruth never called him. He went about alternately resentful at her stubbornness, and seeing himself as a lout cast out of heaven. Then he saw her at a distance, on the platform of the subway station at 72nd Street. She was with Phil Donnelly. She looked well. She was talking gaily, oblivious of old sorrows, certainly not in need of Carl Erickson. That was the end, he knew. 
He watched them take a train, stood there alone, due at a meeting of the Aeronautical Society. But suddenly, not wishing to go, not wishing to go anywhere, nor do anything, friendless, bored, driftwood in the city. So easily had the hawk swooped down into her life, coming by chance, but glad to remain. So easily had he been driven away. For three days he planned a headachy way to make an end of his job and join Bagby, Jr. in his hydroplane experiments. He pictured the crowd that would worship him. He told himself stories unhappily and long about the renewed companionship of Ruth and Phil. He was sure that he, the stranger, had been a fool to imagine that he could ever displace Phil. On the third afternoon, suddenly, apparently without cause, he bolted from the office, and at a public telephone booth he called Ruth. It was she who answered the telephone. "'Can I come up tonight?' he said urgently. "'Yes,' she said. That was all. When he saw her, she hesitated, smiled shamefacedly, and confessed that she had wanted to telephone him. Together, like a stage chorus, they contested. "'I was grouchy. I was beastly. I'm honestly sorry.' "'Well, you forgive? What was it all about? Really, I do not know. I agree with lots of the things you—' "'No, I agree with you, but just at the time, you know—' Her lively, defensive eyes were tender. He put his arm lightly about her shoulders lightly, but his fingertips were sensitive to every thread of her thin bodice that seemed tissue as warmly living as the smooth shoulder beneath. She pressed her eyes against his coat, her coiled dark hair beneath his chin, a longing to cry like a boy, and to care for her like a man, made him reverent. The fear of Phil vanished, intensely conscious of her hair and its individual scent. He did not kiss it. She was scared. She sprang from him, and at the piano hammered out a rattling waltz. It changed to gentler music, and under the shaded piano lamp they were silent, happy. He merely touched her hand. When he went, but he sang his way home, wanting to nod to every policeman. I found her again. It isn't merely play now, he kept repeating, and I've learned something. I don't really know what it is but it's as though I learned a new language. Gee, I'm happy. End of chapter 34